along with you. Okay, thank you, Steve. Let's see if we can get back here to my program. Is that uh, visible to everyone now? Yep, looks good. Okay, well, I'll get started. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to uh, the first uh, of these programs for 2021. Um, I designed this program uh, with all the things in mind that are going on now, like uh, winter weather and the fact that we need to shelter in place and uh, can't uh, do some of the things we normally do. So what I'm uh, going to show you in this program are some uh, very interesting um, pieces of architecture in Humboldt County and uh, tell you a little about uh, the connections they make to our history. But it's also designed in a way that uh, if you want to get out in your car um, sometime in the next few weeks or months, you can go and visit most of these places and they're all on main roads uh, and you wouldn't even have to leave your car to look at a lot of them. And so I'm hoping that if you're feeling a little uh, stir crazy at your home right now and want to get out and connect with our history a little more directly, you can use this program as kind of a prompt to uh, get you out there. So let me see, is this going to work for me to, uh oh, looks like, so I think if you hit just the play button at the top, right. it should open it up as a... Yeah, much better. Okay, here we go. So here we are back with striking structures of Humboldt County. And here's where we're going, the central part of the county. Uh, some of the places we'll be visiting today, very briefly, Arcata. We'll spend a lot of time in Eureka. Uh, we're going to... Uh, investigate a couple of places down at Lolita, and we'll be over at Ferndale once, and Fortuna once, and uh, way down in Scotia for a couple of very interesting buildings, and uh, then also out on Highway 36, all the way out to Bridgeville. So if you look at this map, it will uh, give you an idea of where we're going and how easy it is for you folks to get to these places. Like I say, they're all on highways or former highways and uh, very easy to get to off of either 101 or Highway 36. So let's get rolling here. Um, three noteworthy names, and I'm not sure that they are that noteworthy for most people, but they should be because they are the names of architects who have left a lasting legacy up here in Humboldt County. And we're going to look at these uh, three fellows and what they've done. Uh, John Buck Leonard, Alfred Henry Jacobs, and Frank Georgeson. So let's start off with John Buck Leonard, the artist in concrete. And let's see what he did that made him so famous. What about this bridge? Look familiar? Nice concrete span bridge over a river. Well. You might think it's Fern Bridge, but it's not. It's the Pulaski Bridge over the San Joaquin Valley, and it was built in 1905, six years before Fern Bridge was built. But John Buck Leonard designed them both, and you can see, or you'll see in a moment here, where the Pulaski Bridge inspired him as far as the design of Fern Bridge. So 1911 comes along and, uh, folks out Ferndale Way are very anxious to have a better connection to the rest of the world than having to use the ferries that went across the Lower Eel River. And finally, the county gets up the gumption and the financing to build a bridge at the place that then became Fern Bridge on the Lower Eel. And uh, what's most remarkable about that is that they built the entire bridge using primitive equipment like these um, steam donkeys that are powering pile drivers. Uh, they built the, all of that in less than a year's time. And imagine uh, any Caltrans uh, unit today having to uh, meet that kind of work schedule, I think it would be impossible. Uh, you can see here they have uh, the towers set up for four different pile drivers. Each of them had a steam donkey that were, uh, was powering the driver, pounding into the river bottom. And if you've never heard a pile driver, let me tell you, it makes a 
tremendous noise. I live out at the south end of Eureka and a few years ago when they were doing some work uh, down off of Old Town with a pile driver, I could hear it very clearly out here. And uh, imagine if you were in the Fernbridge area and had four of these going at once. And they went a long time because every time that pile driver dropped to the ground and penetrated into the river bottom, it was only uh, gaining a fraction of an inch. So you'd have to uh, go through multiple, multiple times of uh, the driver driving down into this very hard pan area before they could uh, get uh, deep enough for the posts that they were putting in. So a uh, long, a tedious process, something that they did in what I consider record time. And in November, uh, they were able to open the bridge. Here are a couple of our uh, county supervisors feeling no pain after celebrating for a while. They're there in the bucky, uh, buggy. Uh, Hindley from out in the Matoll and Willison, who I believe was the supervisor for the area that included uh, Fernbridge. And imagine if we were back in those days and had these guys now as our county supervisors wanting to smoke their cigars at the meetings. Uh, I don't think it would work too well. So we've, uh, uh, I think, come a long way in certain directions. But these guys are rightfully proud about uh, having accomplished uh, this uh, construction of this uh, mammoth bridge that spanned a, a very wide river at this point. And as it turned out, did it so successfully that over 100 years later, it's withstood all the floods and is still uh, being used as the main route into Ferndale. And there's a picture of what it looks in uh, recent years. So uh, John uh, Leonard was the right guy at the right time. In the early uh, 1900s, he became fascinated with the potential for using reinforced concrete, where you have the rebar in there and the concrete around it, uh, for constructing uh, office buildings and especially bridges. And he had built uh, four of these bridges in Northern California at the time of the 1906 earthquake. And all of those bridges came through flying colors, no significant damage to any of them, while old style masonry bridges, other types of bridges collapsed. And of course, many of the buildings in San Francisco fell down. And uh, it was a, a point of uh, honor for him to stress how important uh, his design uh, innovations were. He became involved uh, with the city of San Francisco then in establishing a new building code that required that uh, business buildings in downtown San Francisco had to use reinforced concrete. And so uh, because he'd already developed the technique, uh, they were ready to rebuild almost instantly using new specifications. This bridge I'm showing you a picture of here is up on uh, Highway 49 uh, south of uh, Auburn in the gold country. And it was actually a private bridge. It was built for a quarry company that was quarrying uh, rock out of the lower part of the Sierra Nevada. And they had a tremendous weight uh, to the rail cars that were coming down. So this bridge had to be especially heavy duty. When the 1964 flood came, you know, it didn't just hit up here, it also hit down in uh, the Sierra Nevada area and it washed out uh, the Highway 49 highway bridge. Uh, logs jammed up against it and it was swept away. But John Buck Leonard's uh, railroad bridge held and so for a considerable period of time, they rerouted Highway 49 over his railroad bridge until uh, the State Division of Highways could uh, build a new and stronger bridge up there. So Leonard didn't get any credit for designing Fernbridge. Uh, when uh, publicity was put out, it was the county engineer that came uh, uh, claimed the credit for it. And uh, I think Leonard was a little put out by that because he considered Fernbridge his masterpiece. So he had privately printed uh, this book called The Concrete Bridge, uh, partly to sell people on the idea of reinforced concrete, but also to show them some of the work that he had done. And right in the center of it, just like you were in a Playboy magazine, he had a two page fold out of his favorite bridge, which was Fernbridge. And he talks about it here, what the need is for uh, 
using reinforced concrete and why that is the bridge of modern times. So then in the 1920s um, on the Van Dusen River, uh, there was an attempt to modernize the road and bring it up to a high standard. In fact, it was on its way to becoming Highway 36, the first lateral highway that connected the coast with the Central Valley. And the uh, county of Humboldt, which had the responsibility for bridging the Van Dusen, hired uh, John Buck Leonard to design five bridges across the Van Dusen, uh, starting east of Carlotta and winding up at Bridgeville. And those bridges served for a long time. Eventually, uh, they were all deactivated and replaced by other bridges, but they were considered so uh, architecturally significant that two of them were allowed to remain in place. Here's one of them at lower uh, Blackburn grade, which is out past uh, Swimmer's Delight a little ways. And you can pull off Highway 36 and actually walk on a very short section of the old highway and uh, walk on this concrete deck bridge, which is right next to or within 100 yards of the current bridge. You can see though, architecturally, it's not only effective uh, for doing its job, but it's a beautiful span that uh, enhances the scenery out there, unlike a lot of more modern structures. Here's another one of his bridges a little farther out towards Bridgeville. And uh, for a long time, it was pretty exciting to drive Highway 36. As you can see, it wasn't paved yet in 1952, it was gravel. And uh, this particular bridge, for some reason, I guess to save money, they only built as a single lane bridge. And this is at the height of the uh, logging boom out in Eastern Humboldt County. And imagine if you're going up to Bridgeville and met a fully loaded logging truck like this, you would be uh, uh, very quick to pull out of the way and give it uh, the right of way. So uh, here we're looking at the deck of the bridge, the top side of it, and it doesn't look so impressive when seen that way. But if you look down from the Van Dusen River, you can see it's another one of these graceful arch spans. And in fact, you get that mirror effect. So you have this oval that's framed in the photo. This was considered a significant enough bridge that was a, a photograph by the federal government. And uh, this is actually a photo from the Library of Congress. So anyway, there are five of the bridges. And the last one was up here at Bridgeville. And uh, I took this photo maybe 15, 20 years ago. It's been replaced now by a very ugly bridge that uh, goes across just down river from this. But there you can see the old uh, John Buck Leonard span and then off to the uh, right of that, you have some of the buildings in Bridgeville. So thanks to Leonard, uh, you could now go up as far as Bridgeville, uh, crisscrossing the Van Dusen River without uh, having to go along the steep crumbling cliffs like the older road did. And uh, you can still, like I say, see his legacy, of course, drive across it at Fernbridge, but uh, I'd suggest taking a trip up Highway 36 and stopping to look at these other two uh, bridges that are left from the five that he built there. Okay, any questions about John Buck Leonard and his bridges? We can do that now. Okay. Okay, we'll wait and you'll have another chance in another 10 minutes. So Alfred Henry Jacobs uh, is noted up here and we'll see just what for in a moment, but he gained his reputation, his great fame uh, for designing uh, the massive movie houses that were built in the 1910s and 1920s across the nation, but uh, were virtual palaces that people would uh, go to to see, of course, uh, silent movies at first and then the talkies. And some of the buildings he designed uh, gained great notice. Here he is. Uh, he actually uh, was a volunteer at the San Francisco Zoo. And as you can see with these two tiger cubs, uh, he got quite close to his work. I think he had to sacrifice his sweater from the cause here. You can see that the, the cubs have enjoyed the tugging into the fabric. So the California theater uh, was designed by him in 1917, a massive uh, structure, not quite as big as the skyscraper business building next to it, but uh, 
certainly a monumental uh, building for a theater. And then even more ornately, the Granada Theater in uh, 1921. And if you look at the marquee, we can see that Claire Bow uh, is uh, starring in some movie, but I can't uh, quite read the title of that. So we're still back in the silent movie era. And then the Curran Theater, a uh, slightly more modest, but very substantial building with a nice facade on it. So uh, among his structures were those three down in San Francisco. And about uh, just a year before, or two years before he uh, uh, designed and had the Curran uh, built, he actually came up to Humboldt County at the invitation of the Pacific Lumber Company to construct theater up here. The Winnema Theater in Scotia, still standing on the main street of uh, Scotia. Uh, uh, locals like calling it the Winnema Cinema. Uh, so you have the rhyme there, designed uh, by him in 1920 and built out of old growth redwood. Of course, Pacific Lumber Company was furnishing all of that. And uh, they created uh, what looks to me uh, like a, a sort of uh, uh, Norse hunting lodge, something from uh, the deep north, a very substantial low building but with massive timbers, uh, maybe something out of the myths of the uh, Norse gods. But for some reason, uh, the owners of Scotia, the Pacific Lumber Company owners, decided that they would name it for Winnema. And it took me a while to find out anything about uh, who this person was, but gradually uh, I learned that it was named for this woman, Toby Winnema Riddle. She was a Modoc Indian uh, from northeastern Humboldt County. And uh, she was actually quite famed uh, in her life for several things, including uh, being willing to ride out with the boys on these raiding campaigns and uh, was apparently the equal of most of the male warriors in what she did. She also had an important connection to another Modoc, uh, Kent Puash, who we know normally as Captain Jack, who was involved in the so-called Modoc War out in the lava beds. And that's actually where Winema gained her fame. Um, she was actually, uh, a sort of middle person, a contact between uh, the whites, the military and the peace commission that uh, was trying to end the conflict between the uh, soldiers out there and the Modoc Indians who were holed up in the lava beds uh, fighting for their land. And uh, she was present at this infamous incident where there was a meeting with the various peace commissioners and General Canby, who was in charge of the soldiers out there, was shot and killed uh, by uh, a couple of the Indians. And here, Toby is down here in this uh, drawing from a, uh, one of the, uh, I think it's the Harper's Weekly, and she is protecting uh, Alfred Meacham, who was one of the uh, peace convoy men who came out there to try to settle the dispute. And meanwhile, Captain Jack is uh, shooting Canby. Um, if uh, Winema hadn't intervened here, it's possible more of the whites would have been killed. And so, 18 years later, Meacham, who never forgot that she had saved his life, uh, persuaded Congress to grant uh, Winema Riddell uh, a $25 a month pension for the rest of her life, which she collected for 29 years afterwards. So uh, at the time and in certain circles, she was well known and considered quite famous. How that fame translated out to her being uh, uh, name using her name for the theater in Scotia, I still haven't been able to find out. So if any of you folks uh, are uh, interested in uh, pursuing that, I hope you will, and I hope you'll let me know if you find out something. And uh, here are some of the, the uh, theater tickets. Uh, when it used to be a movie house, it's been a long time since you go to movies at the Winema, but uh, it's uh, still used occasionally for various events. 
In fact, the Historical Society had an annual uh, meeting out there once and a speaker. Okay. More questions? Any questions? Okay. Okay. So our last uh, architect is actually a local boy who also designed uh, some theaters, uh, Frank Georgeson. Uh, he was the son of uh, Fred Georgeson, who was a uh, mayor of Eureka and who uh, also was uh, the publisher of one of the local newspapers. But Frank became an architect. And uh, let's look at what he did up here, because uh, I think you'll uh, be surprised at how many structures he had a hand in. One of his most famous, the Minor Theater in 1914 or shortly thereafter when it was uh, photographed on a rainy day, you can see the wet concrete down there. And about a hundred years later, photographed on a, another rainy day, uh, one of his structures that's been maintained and improved on in some ways so that uh, it uh, retains its integrity, but uh, is fortunately in very good shape. Another theater, uh, now the Arkley, but uh, the uh, used to be the Richard Swayze Theater down at uh, fourth between fourth and fifth on F Street in Eureka. A little bit like uh, some of Alfred Henry Jacobs uh, theaters down in the San Francisco area. The Muni Auditorium, he designed monumental structure. Uh, look at all the reinforced concrete there. That would have pleased John Buck Leonard. And here's a more recent photo of the building. And here's part of its interior. Uh, not the most charming place, but definitely impressive. And uh, one that is uh, built to withstand local earthquakes pretty well, I think. The Eureka Women's Club just recently got a paint job. So he could uh, work not just in concrete, but he could do things with wooden buildings. Beautiful craftsman style uh, structure of his, uh, the Christian Scientist Church here in Eureka. 1914, same year that he uh, designed the uh, minor theater. Now down in Lolita, and so you could leave Eureka and go down to Lolita, and uh, we're going to have a couple of things to look at here. Uh, the uh, Creamery, which uh, uh, was built, I believe, about 1919, and uh, was owned by several different companies over time, and of course has been shuttered for a number of years now. Uh, Two-story brick structure with uh, the big uh, cooling tower and back. If you see this uh, tower back here, that's about five stories tall. And if you look at some of the other creameries, such as the one in Arcata, uh, there used to be a very tall tower there also. And uh, these towers had a very specialized purpose. They were used uh, to create condensed milk. Uh, and uh, the concept was actually uh, first uh, uh, noticed by people who wanted to create uh, musket balls, uh, like say during the time of the Revolutionary War. And what you wanted was a piece of metal lead that was perfectly spherical. And you wanted to create a lot of them at a single uh, point in time. So they built uh, back east and even in the Midwest places that they call shot towers. These uh, tall uh, buildings that were five stories or so tall. They would uh, take the molten lead or they would uh, heat it up on the top floor and then they would pour it through a grating that uh, had uh, small holes throughout and uh, that would separate uh, the molten mass into very small droplets. And as they fell, they would cool rapidly and as they moved through the air, they would, by the time they'd gotten to the ground floor form perfect spheres. And so you'd have them down there, they'd be cool enough that they didn't join together anymore, and you had your musket balls. Well, at some point in time, some uh, bright individual decided, well, could we do something like that with milk, where we don't want to just have liquid milk, but we want a, a dried version of that. And so they tried the same system with spraying milk out at the top of a tower like this and letting it uh, fall 
five stories down. And sure enough, it worked. And so you'd have these condensation plants that would condense milk like that. This particular facility in World War II got a contract from the army to supply food uh, for the GIs. And they took it one step further. They created what they call dehydrated or um, instant ice cream. And it was made out of milk. And I don't know how they ever got it iced, but the idea was that you added water to it and you would get a substance that would be kind of like runny ice cream. And uh, it proved so popular that they had to truck in milk from very far away, way out of Humboldt County to uh, Lolita because the demand was so great and they were running uh, double shifts to create the uh, condensed material that uh, they couldn't keep up with it with the supply they had here. So here's an industrial building quite different from a lot of the buildings that uh, Georgeson uh, created. But if you just go down to half a block and turn onto the main street of Lolita, you'll see the Bank of Lolita, or what used to be, it's now their community services district building. But uh, 1920, he designed this kind of uh, faux Grecian temple building uh, that uh, I think uh, lent uh, solidarity to the image of the bank and made people uh, confident that if they bank somewhere like this, their money was going to be safe. And uh, the same year that he was designing that, he was designing another bank in the kind of Grecian style, the Bank of Scotia, which is just catty corner from the Winnema Cinema, just across the street and down a, about a quarter of a block. And of course, the big difference here is that instead of uh, using concrete and uh, facing it, uh, imitated marble like he did with the Bank of Lolita, once again, uh, Pacific Lumber Company was providing old growth logs, which as you can see, they make perf uh, perfect uh, columns, fluted columns, just with the bark uh, creating the effect that you want. Uh, so in a number of years, this uh, served as the bank in Scotia. When it closed as a bank, a Pacific Lumber Company turned it into the museum. And up until a few years ago, at least, uh, they had that open regularly. I haven't been down in quite a while, and uh, I'm afraid that the, you don't have much access to it anymore. But from the outside, certainly worth looking at. And like I say, just across the street, you can see the Winnema Cinema. So there's Georgeson for you. Um, uh, there are certainly other buildings that he's done up here, but we covered a number of them, and you might be able to pick out some other ones on your own. And so once again, questions? Uh, there was a question that's going back to the bridges section. Yeah. Um, so did the Bridgeville Bridge follow the same alignment and abutments as the covered bridge that preceded it? Yeah, uh, there's actually been four bridges now out there. Uh, the first bridge was built in the 1870s uh, and I've never seen an image of that it uh, washed out just a few years later, I think 1881 approximately. And uh, there are several people on the bridge when it started to give way and they ran for their lives. But one little kid, Eddie Hale, the son of the storekeeper out there, didn't make it. And he was washed downstream and drowned. And so the next bridge was built uh, with uh, firmer pilings and it uh, was a wooden covered bridge. In fact, I know Steve, has an image or two of that and he shared one with me. Uh, so it, uh, uh, the entire deck of the bridge was covered, uh, but it was a, a quite long deck uh, to go across the Van Dusen. So that was uh, bridge number two. Then uh, the Leonard Bridge dated from 1925 or 26. That's the one that you could see in that photo that was the concrete deck bridge. And then uh, what was it, 10, 15 years ago, uh, Caltrans designed a new bridge uh, that bypassed Bridgeville entirely and crossed the river like a quarter mile downstream. And so now if you want to get to Bridgeville, you actually have to get off the highway. And the Leonard Bridge is blocked off at both ends, so you can't drive out on it, but you can walk on it. Okay, enough on that. Yeah, and okay. then there was another question as to whether you can drive from Bridgeville to Arcata on the Neeland Road. On uh, yes, 
Uh, I would highly recommend in the springtime, probably in May, driving out to Bridgeville uh, on Highway 36 at Bridgeville turning left, going north, and taking the bridgeville Neeland Road, which is absolutely stupendously beautiful that time of year. Uh, the green prairies, uh, wildflowers uh, abound out there in many locations. And uh, you do have to drive on a, it's a very good wide uh, gravel road until you get to the former community of Iaquay. That's about halfway back to uh, Eureka. From then on, it's paved, but uh, the road in the summertime is in very good condition, not used too much. Uh, so there'd be no problem with a, just a typical sedan, let alone a SUV going on that road. And the other wonderful thing about that trip, uh, my wife and I, my wife Gisela and I took this two summers ago, there are no sign of cannabis cultivation projects along the road that we saw between Bridgeville and uh, Neyland. Uh, a lot of the land out there is ranch land that has been put uh, into land trusts. And unlike the stretch of road south of Bridgeville, where you go down to Alder Point and Garberville, where almost all you see along the roadside are fences and cannabis cultivations behind them, on uh, this particular stretch of road going north from Bridgeville, you don't see that at all. And you really get a sense of what the area looked like 100 years or so ago. Uh, so I'd highly recommend that. And uh, like I say, if you want to take it at the peak time, I think sometime in May when the wildflowers are out, maybe late May would be a really good time to take that trip. OK, OK, here we go. Now we're going to go to Eureka. And uh, well, and a couple other places, we're going to look at some house styles. And uh, here I am out at Centerville Beach. Uh, my wife took this picture, and I think she felt I was talking too long. So she managed to make it look like my arm is being held up by that metal post because it's been stuck out there so long. But I really didn't talk that long. So here's what I know about our architecture. Not a whole lot. And so I'm sure there are people watching this program today that could elaborate on what I say, but I'm trying to stick to the basics here uh, with a few different buildings and styles. And what I'd like to do is encourage you folks, if you have an interest in the buildings themselves and what the architectural style is, uh, what some of the little features are on them, that uh, you make a point of uh, familiarizing yourself with uh, some of the terms and what some of the things look like. And I'm going to have a suggestion for a book here at the end about that. Uh, and then you can go out and drive the streets of Eureka and Arcata. And my wife and I go out and have our masks with us. And we walk along uh, some of these streets. And uh, we identify some of the buildings that you'll see here and then try to pick out the features. So. Uh, this is one of the styles that we uh, actually see here occasionally in Eureka. Uh, and it had its uh, start uh, in Paris in the 1780s uh, when they wanted to limit the height of the buildings. And they said that uh, you could only uh, have a building that was 20 meters, that's about 65 feet high, uh, up to the cornice line. That's the line that separates uh, the main part of the building from uh, the roof. But the, the clever French in Paris uh, figured out a way to get around that. They actually uh, created a sharply angled roof that allowed them to put a bunch of dormer windows in, like you see here, and create essentially one more story to their building, which uh, went above the 20 meter limit. But uh, because it was considered part of the roof and uh, not a building side, they were able to get away with that. And so here we have another example of it, uh, the second empire style referring to the time period in France uh, when uh, they had a revival of imperialism and uh, uh, one of the Napoleons was ruling. And here we have our own example uh, down at uh, 3rd and F Street or 2nd and F Street in Eureka. Uh, and you'll see the same features in both of these buildings, the hood mold over the windows, uh, this uh, very strong, heavily accentuated arch. And then, of course, the mansard roof that uh, goes back at an angle from the cornice line. 
And this is the former Odd Fellows Hall uh, that was built in 1882. And they really didn't make use of the third story. You see, there's no windows up there, uh, nothing up there at all, but they adopted the basic style of the second uh, empire mansard roof. But here's a better example where you have the full tilt mansard roof with the uh, uh, windows uh, on the second, what's really the second floor, but doesn't count. Uh, this is over on, uh, not very far from the Historical Society office on I Street. And so by uh, the standards in France, that's what they would measure for the height of the building, just the 14 feet between the ground level and the cornice line. And so that second story doesn't uh, really count as far as they're concerned uh, with their restrictions in France. Here, they don't really care about that. Well, here we're down at uh, the Carson block on F Street between 2nd and 3rd, back uh, when it was in its original glory before it was uh, transformed and uh, renovated into its new great glory. Um, and you can tell uh, even uh, here that it was a building of great substance and uh, you know, massive structure, a lot of brick and stonework. And uh, if you look, you can see the first national bank was down here uh, on one corner. And if there's any uh, sort of business that wants to uh, give its patrons a feeling of confidence, it's a bank. And we saw that with the temple style that was used at the Bank of Scotia and the Bank at Lolita. Well, here it was done um, in the Carson block. And to do that, they adopted uh, this architectural style, uh, the Richardson Romanesque that was very common in the Midwest uh, using brick and stonework with these arches that were kind of elongated and uh, emphasized as part of the entrance to buildings. Here we've got a post office up in Minnesota that uses the same style. Not too good in earthquake country though, if you're trying to use brick or something for a three-story building. Now here's a rarity. We're down on Union Street, west side of Eureka, just a couple of blocks away from uh, the Caltrans office, uh, a little ways north of uh, Wabash Avenue. And what do we have here? A very unusual structure. Here's a more famous example, an octagon house. So eight sided, it's the only octagon I found up here. Uh, if other people know of octagons, I'd love to find out about them. But uh, this one is still there. You can tell it's not in the greatest shape, but it's being maintained to some extent. And so if you want to see an architectural oddity, this is uh, one of the best examples up here. I've uh, never been too taken with the structure from a practical point of view because in the interior of it, uh, creates all of these odd angles. And so it's very difficult to create rooms that have the proper balance when you've uh, got uh, these uh, walls that jut out at a very obtuse angle and make it hard for you to uh, create the interior space. It's almost like the rooms have to be sliced up like pieces of pie. Then if you go down to Ferndale, I have one of the oldest houses in the county uh, belonging to one of the founders, S. Lewis uh, Shaw of Ferndale. And it's a great example of uh, the carpenter Gothic style with these really steeply pitched gables. Uh, so everything's very angular and narrow and points upward. And uh, you're now in a time period where you could use a type of power saw to do the scroll work. You didn't have to do things by hand. And so you start seeing a lot more ornamentation on the houses that were built during that time period and also this pinnacle sticking up. So you're emphasizing kind of like with a Gothic cathedral, uh, the angularity and then the, the rising line of the building. Carpenter Gothic style. You go over to Ferndale, we're just one block north of uh, Main Street in uh, uptown, old town Ferndale. We have this great example of a bungalow and let's look at some of its features. Got a low pitched gable roof with a wide overhang at the edges. Um, you know, bungalows were often uh, used in hot climates. Uh, 
very popular in Southern California. And so you wanted to shade the windows. You wanted uh, these types of overhangs, not quite as important up here, but architecturally it worked very well and was uh, translated uh, into the buildings here without much change. And then these braces uh, on the purlins uh, on the roof, uh, they uh, accentuated those, uh, made them stick out, made them prominent. And you can see the people that had this house painted made sure that you'd uh, notice them because they're painted a contrasting color. And one of my favorite features uh, on the porches of these bungalows, they have the, the piers uh, that are holding up uh, the, the, the roof over the, uh, the porch. Uh, are sloping uh, rather than uh, being straight. Uh, sometimes they can go straight up, but they don't look quite as attractive. Uh, but if you manage to do it just right, you can create a very a nice line by angling the, the piers, tapering them off gently as they go upward. And then the doors are always a great wonder on uh, bungalow houses. A lot of times made out of a solid oak or at least a oak uh, done in different ways uh, with paneling oftentimes and little lights as they call them, panes of glass in the window, uh, window uh, area above uh, the door handle. Uh, so you can go here in Eureka or in Ferndale, other places where there are bungalows and just look at the doors and see a variety of wonderful door styles. Uh, and uh, you know, these had to be handcrafted and were works of art in and of themselves. So a craftsman bungalow. Any questions? Okay. Now we're going to uh, finish up. This is the last uh, segment of the program. We're going to go to Henderson Center in Eureka. Six striking structures north of Henderson Center. And here they are. They're on G Street and on uh, E Street and on D Street within a few blocks of each other. Uh, this is uh, just south of Booner on G Street, and uh, it's uh, been quite a showpiece for a number of years. Uh, about 20 years ago, uh, it was painted a slightly different color instead of this brown that sort of mimics the uh, terracotta uh, tiles. Uh, it was more of a pink color that uh, really offset things well, I thought. Here's another example of it in Southern California, uh, Spanish Revival. Um, you know, the architecture that would have been used places in California many, many years ago. Very popular style down in Southern California, but you don't see it quite as uh, much up here. How about this guy? This is just two doors down from uh, the Spanish Revival House, same block of G Street. And here's another example of it that accentuates some of the features a little more strongly. Uh, art moderne. So now we're getting up into mid-century, uh, mid-20th century. Uh, Dr. Sam Beret, that the Beret Center uh, was named for, uh, actually designed this uh, house and a house over at uh, Booner and uh, H Street, which is a, an apartment building a little larger than this one. But you can see some uh, very uncommon features, uh, such as the rounded window here, uh, the actual curved window at the uh, edge of the building. You see it here also. Uh, you actually get the feeling of motion with this building because of the, the roundedness of the one wall. And especially here, it almost seems like a, a ship, a boat that's uh, moving in one direction. Uh, so unlike a lot of buildings that want to create this feeling of fixedness and just being stuck in their place, you actually, I, I think, get a, a sense here of mobility that, that kind of runs counter to what we're usually thinking about with these sorts of buildings. And then two doors down from that same block, now we're back to this very staid, solid, squarish or rectangular style. You see a lot in New England, a lot across country, actually. Uh, colonial revival going way back to early times in the United States and pre-United uh, State time when we were part of the colonies. So it was actually a colonial building. 
And you can see everything's very four square about this, uh, not a lot of ornamentation. They allow themselves to have a little roof over the portico here and maybe a couple of columns or, or so, but the windows are matched up. And uh, one of the few decorative elements that are allowed are the shutters, which if you notice here, for example, would not be functional because even if you closed them, it would, if you could close them, it would leave part of the window exposed, but it creates a nice contrast with the rest of the building. And so aesthetically it works pretty well. So here, thanks to Google Earth, we'll show you exactly where those are if you want to go out and uh, drive along there and take a look. So here's Booner Street. Here's G Street, here's Carson Park. And if you went down to the bottom of this photo and went uh, another couple of blocks, you'd be right in Henderson Center. So we're gonna look at G Street south of Booner. There's the Spanish Revival House. You can see that kind of pinkish brown coloration to it. And there's the Art Modern House with a very flattish looking roof. And then here's our big rectangle standing out, the Colonial Revival Building. So if you just walk that block down there, you'll see three great examples uh, on one side of the street and several other buildings of interesting style on the other side that I didn't go into detail uh, here, but uh, if you go out, you might want to try identifying them for yourself. Now we're over at the corner of uh, E and Booner, and uh, we have a building here that, uh, is I think maybe unique for the area because of its uh, roof line. And especially if you look over here at the uh, part that faces onto Booner Street, and what we actually have is what's called a Flemish gable. Uh, you'd find that back in New Amsterdam and in the areas of uh, New York and other places where people from the low countries came. Uh, for ornamental effect, you could just have a, a straight off, uh, uh, squarish or triangular shaped gable there, but uh, by putting this kind of false front on it, it creates a much more pleasant decorative uh, image. But uh, it's not common up here, and this is the best example I've seen. So that's corner of uh, uh, Booner and E. And if we go over to D Street and uh, north one block, we come to the Kate Harpst house. Um, her husband was part of a partnership Harpst and Spring. They had a shingle mill out in uh, Sunnybrae before Sunnybrae was there and made enough money that uh, Kate Harps, the widow, could build this house down in Eureka. Incidentally, she was one of the founding members of the Humble Women's Save the Redwoods League. And if any of you have seen this wonderful picture from 19... Uh, 17, when there are these four elderly women standing in front of a dark car and on the side of the car is a banner saying, Save the Redwoods. Uh, Kate Harps is one of those four women. And this is the house that uh, she uh, lived in for a number of years. And here, if we go over to Italy, we see uh, the inspiration for that, the Tuscan revival uh, houses that would be up on these hills in Tuscany, and they would have uh, a low a hipped roof, a tile roof. Uh, they would uh, uh, always have this feeling of massiveness and solidarity. You can see these things look like uh, it take you know a, a huge earthquake or something to move them. Uh, and often they're squarish or certainly rectangular in uh, shape. And then finally, we're going to uh, finish up with the Pewter House, which is at uh, Booner and E, and it's just across the street from our Flemish Gable. I took this photo a few years ago before the remodeling that's in progress right now uh, was starting, but uh, uh, most of the features are still uh, there. They've been uh, elaborated on and uh, uh, resurrected in some cases. So if we go down to Pasadena, we see a building with a similar roof style, one of the most uh, famous craftsman homes anywhere, Green and Green's Gamble House in Pasadena. Um, and you can see that uh, the Pewter House certainly uh, would fit in stylistically uh, with Green and Green's building. And we'll come back to the 
pewter house in a moment, but let me show you here. So you can do another little walking tour of a couple of blocks. You just, uh, you can walk right over from G Street, F Street um, area where we saw the first three houses. So here's Booner again, now we're over at D and E and just down at the bottom of the photo, we'd be reaching Henderson Center. And here's the house with the Flemish gable. There's the Kate Harpst house. And there, look at that roof line that goes off in several different directions for the second floor of the uh, pewter house on the corner. So the pewter house was built in 1912 and uh, it was designed by a couple of brothers from the Los Angeles area, Arthur and Alfred Heinemann. And uh, they were sometimes called the poor man's green and green. They were building their houses and are designing them at the same time that green and green did, but they were uh, sometimes maybe a notch below in terms of uh, the expense that was involved in the refinement of the features, but they could create some really masterful pieces like the Parsons House, 1910. So it was designed just a couple of years before they designed the Pewter House. And making use of a feature that's common in Southern California, where you have a lot of this rounded rock in the dry river washes, the Santa Ana River and the Los Angeles River, uh, these rivers that come off the steep uh, mountains, the San Gabriels and the San Bernardino Mountains. And they were often used architecturally uh, sometimes to build entire uh, houses, uh, cloud the uh, entire exterior, and sometimes here for foundation work and uh, the chimneys. So this is how the house looked originally, but then they moved it. And you can imagine what was involved with that. And here in actually a more pleasant setting, I think, and you can see the extensive use they made from the rock, which is just an outstanding feature of the house. And if you go by the pewter house, you'll notice that now as it is being renovated, uh, they actually have brought in rounded rock and are uh, covering some of the concrete areas below the windows with river rock that uh, kind of echoes what Hyman and Hyman did down here in Southern California. So let's look at the roof line, especially here in this house with those ex exposed uh, purlins and that uh, low obtuse uh, triangle angular uh, roof covering. And look how similar it is to what they designed up here for the pewter house. So you can see that uh, we're uh, getting an example of these architects when they were on a roll and probably at their peak of designing buildings. So, like I said, they weren't as famous as Charles and Henry Green, uh, but one of the brothers uh, who wound up working in later years on his own uh, did become famous. Uh, he's the only person that can claim the title for having done this. He created this building in uh, San Luis Obispo, it used to be on Old Highway 101, and it has the distinction of being the world's first motel. Building still standing, but it's in disrepair, and I don't think there's even a monument to it. But uh, here is the uh, begetter of Super 8 and Motel 6 and uh, all Travelers Inn and all the other chains that we've seen for years and years, but got its start here thanks to Arthur Heinemann. So uh, when you go by the Pewter House the next time, you can think of... Uh, what he did in a more commercial way here in San Luis Obispo and uh, be glad that he confined himself to uh, doing the craftsman style house up here. So if you folks are interested in going out and walking around and looking at places, uh, this is what my wife Gisela and I do pretty often. And uh, we will take uh, what we've done. Uh, we've used this wonderful book by Rachel Carley and there are other books around but for a single book that captures a lot of this, we would just photocopy pages like this Queen Anne uh, seaside cottage here and take it out with us. And then when we come to something that we're uh, wondering about, oh, like, uh, oh, for example, uh, the pinnacle up here, uh, which often surmounts the roof. And then the very top part of that being called the, the finial or that there's a beveled post here that actually has been uh, worked on a lathe to create a certain effect, or the brackets that are used to support things. You can go around and pick out these features on a house and use uh, you know, this book, uh, 
uh, for that purpose. We don't take the whole book, we just take a couple of pages with us at a time. And so, last chance for questions. Um, while we're waiting for questions, I did wanna uh, mention that we do have that book at the library and it is available um, to pick up via curbside service. So um, if you're interested in getting that book, you can put it on hold on your account online or just call up your local library branch let them know that you want it and we'll put it on hold for you. And then all you have to do is drive up front to the library and we'll bring it out to you. Oh, great. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful book. And of course there are other ones uh, also. It's one of the smaller books that you can easily carry around, but it does uh, cover things pretty succinctly. And, you know, I'm sure that one of the librarians can advise people on other possibilities also for books like this. So uh, thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, and then also the, um, the house that was um, designed by the woman who helped save the Redwoods. Um, yeah. Last month's lecture was about those women who save, helped save the Redwoods. Yeah. Um, so if you missed that lecture, we do have it on our YouTube channel. So you can always go back and watch it there. So I'll put a link okay. in the chat if you're interested in that. Okay, wonderful. Okay. Anybody else? Last chance for now. Okay. Well, here we are going to finish up. Of course, we had to throw in this guy. And I'm going to so not just Eureka's most famous structure, but claims are made that this is the uh, most widely photographed house in the United States. Have no idea how they can make that claim because it's not like anyone out there is counting photographers, but I think you can certainly say it is one of the most widely photographed buildings It shows up in all sorts of books. How about its style? So I pondered this for a long time. I had, used to do a walking tour of uh, downtown Eureka, and we mentioned this building, I wanted to describe it in some way. So I came up with my own style. We can decide if you think it's appropriate or not, but I call it vainglorious Victorian. And so if you look at the conglomeration of features there and the ostentatiousness of it, well, rather tastefully done in certain ways, uh, I think you might agree with that, but I'll let you ponder that. And that means that we have reached the end of the program. Thanks very much. Uh, stay safe. Uh, go out and enjoy things uh, when you get the chance. But, you know, be safe about it. And uh, I hope to do another program for you next year. That's it from here. All right. Well, thanks, Jerry. That was very informative. I didn't realize how many cool houses were in my neighborhood. So now I'm definitely going to go look for them when I take my dog for a walk. <laughs> <Great>. um, yeah. <laughs> And yeah, so thank you everyone for joining us. Um, this is a really big group. So it's really awesome to connect with everybody, especially on these rainy days. Um, and next month, um, we've got another um, lecture coming. And I think Steve, you were gonna um, kind of tease that for next month. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just wanna remind people we've got, uh, we've got these running every month and uh, thanks to the efforts of Joanne Bauer. Next month is gonna be presented by Karen Hendricks. Uh, it's a talk about a murder of a Humboldt Vaquero in Mendocino County and 125 years ago. It's titled All Good Buckaroos Come to Die in Humboldt. And Karen, if you don't know, is one of these folks that has a real passion for genealogy. Uh, she's she's a very involved in the genealogical society. She's also compiled a lot of uh, uh, indexes to the hit, to the local cemeteries, which are just invaluable resources. And uh, she often gets, uh, like many of these folks, sucked into the history, uh, maybe somewhat uh, unwittingly. But uh, I think uh, I think you're in for a treat. So I welcome everybody to join us next month. I think it's going to be a great talk, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. And thanks for everybody once again for coming out today. All right. So thanks to everybody for joining us. Um, as I've mentioned before, we'll be recording this. So if you wanna rewatch it or send it to a friend, um, the YouTube link is in our chat window. And I'll also make sure to put it on the e next email with the invite for um, next month's presentation. And with that, I will go ahead and wish everybody a um, happy weekend. Everyone stay safe and we'll see you next time. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.